I'm Robin Jick Woolley from uh, Beecham Research. Uh, we are an uh, analyst in the uh, IoT space, uh, been uh, in this uh, area for uh, nearly 20 years. Um, and uh, so this, this is uh, scaling your IoT solution in a volatile landscape, uh, moving from a small scale IoT solution to a large one or scaling it can be, uh, can be challenging. So in this roundtable session, uh, I'm joined by uh, IoT experts from uh, different companies to discuss these challenges uh, and how best to, to address them. So I have uh, uh, with me um, Saeed Hussain, uh, otherwise known as Z, um, and I shall, I shall refer to him as Z because it's a lot easier. <laughs> uh, and uh, he's the founder and uh, CTO of uh, Aeris Communications. We have uh, Vijay uh, Raghavan, uh, General Manager, IoT Motorola Solutions, and uh, Brian Schreiber, uh, who is Vice President, Security and uh, Privacy uh, Technologies uh, Cable Labs. So I think before we continue, um, I'll just ask uh, each of our uh, participants to uh, say a little bit about themselves and uh, and what they do and and how they relate to the uh, um, uh, topic that uh, that we're uh, that we're discussing. So so Z, if you could just say a few words. Certainly. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate that. And welcome, everybody, and welcome to the panelists uh, for today's session. Uh, I'm the founder and the CTO at Aeris Communications. We are a global IoT services provider from sort of the communications through the data analytics portions of a large number of IoT devices uh, pretty much around the world at this point, although we started in North America. We have over 15 million devices deployed today. Uh, serving a variety of different markets. Not surprisingly, uh, automotive is our uh, is a natural for cellular IoT, which is what we do. And so of the 15 plus million devices, the vast majority of them are fleets and automotive, at least two thirds of them. And the rest of them are in a variety of different markets, ranging from industrial IoT to medical solutions to uh, financial solutions, et cetera. Large number of devices that are performing end-to-end -end IoT solutions, uh, the IoT applications, if you will, for a variety of different needs. We work directly with enterprises, enterprises, and we uh, support them through uh, whatever is necessary for them to get their IoT solution deployed. Great. Okay. Back here, Robin. Yeah, that's great. So uh, you'll notice that Z is uh, not on video. Uh, he has a, a local um, broadband issue, which um, um, I, I understand is to do with. Uh, cable rather than wireless uh, so right. uh, <clears throat> yeah that's that's fine but at least yeah. you can join us on voice that's the most important thing <laughs> so uh, vj i don't know if you could say a few words <clears throat> uh good morning good evening everyone wherever you are so vijay raghavan uh, i lead iot in uh, motorola solutions and our focus on iot is very much about what we term as mission critical iot this is where you when you're serving uh, distributed industries such as utilities uh, electric grids, oil and gas, and public safety and military industries, where it becomes very critical to have five lines reliability, as well as top level security in terms of what you do in IoT. So as uh, Robin was saying, there's a extreme in terms of what IoT is from consumer oriented devices at one end, and we are very much the other end of the spectrum on how do you scale uh, in pl places where you don't want any, any risk or any reliability holes in IoT. And we do end to end solutions in that area. Super, that's great, that's, uh, that's terrific. And then Brian, uh, perhaps you could say a few words uh, to uh, uh, introduce yourself. Sure, um, Brian Scriber, I'm a distinguished technologist at Cable Labs. I also lead the security and privacy or privacy as our uh, English uh, friends are yeah. want to say. Let's be specific <laughs> about that. <laughs> um, the uh, the team I'm on uh, at Cable Labs, we're looking at this from the network operations side, um, particularly, you know, when we look at traffic, how to manage, um, but really on the secure interoperability. And for the last six years, I've been engaged with the Open Connectivity Foundation, the All Seen Alliance, Open Interconnect Consortium, Zigbee Alliance, um, really trying to drive to secure interoperability and uh, making sure that what we have is scalable and uh, allows us uh, the, the level of control that we need. Fantastic, that's, uh, that's really good. So my first question then is to, uh, is to Z. Um, <clears throat> uh, so Z, what, what do you think are the key issues that need to be considered when scaling an IoT solution? I think this is a sort of general question to sort of get the, uh, the pitch of the horde, if you like. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Robin. I'll, I'll give it a shot to sort of set the stage for what I'm hoping the other panelists will either support or say I'm, I'm not giving them the, <laughs> the right uh, direction. Uh, the important point to recognize is that over the years, IoT has grown steadily in, and has become more of a, a need that is pretty uh, uh, in, in required pretty much in just about in any market that you can think of. And the point is that people go into it without really understanding that scaling. And what I mean by scaling is in growth in the numbers of deployed devices uh, requires a fair amount of planning up front. And I think it's important. And I like the fact that about half the audience has got a few thousand, uh, less than a thousand devices because they're the ones who need to get themselves oriented towards what it takes to grow that, assuming that there has a need to grow that from a thousand to 10,000 to half a million or more devices. We have some customers who have successfully deployed multiple millions of devices in our network. And yet we have a whole bunch that are startup that are just getting started. So if you look at it that uh, from the perspective that uh, you need to plan what you're going to do, not only from a device design perspective, from a update perspective, from a security perspective, uh, a manufacturing perspective, but what happens to your backend systems? Are you putting in place everything that you need to be able to receive the data from these large numbers of deployed devices and handle it? And if you're providing a service where you need to be able to bill an end user customer, are you receiving the information sufficiently timely? And are you processing the information in a way that allows you to be able to bill successfully? We've had customers you know, in the past who were small startups that said, uh, you know, we're just going to use uh, Excel for our billing. And then when you come down to it, when you have 50, 100,000, 250,000 devices, you have to have planned ahead of time for them to be able to even generate a bill and understand the amount of information that we send them to be able to generate a bill effectively for their end users. So there's lots of detail and you need to make sure that whether you're in the design phase or the manufacturing phase, or even in a simple installation phase, how do you get the devices out and installed and then analyze that data that's coming in and then build the customer, you have to start upfront. And that's the key issue that I want to emphasize. My final point I will mention is that in this day and age, security has become an incredibly important problem. And I think both Brian and Vijay are going to spend some time talking about that, which I think is, is incredibly important to understand that we have had occurrences of security breaches in the IoT space that could have been uh, incredibly destructive to not only that specific application, but also to the people using the same networks. And that is something that we all need to watch out in the future. And I'm sure we're gonna to touch more on that in a few minutes. Yeah, um, can I just uh, follow that up with uh, saying, can you uh, think of any, um, any examples? I mean, no names, no names, but uh, can you think of any examples of uh, clients yeah. that have come to you with uh, some serious problems actually that uh, they probably didn't plan to uh, to scale uh, properly, and maybe they had some uh, issues as a result of that. Okay. Well, let me give you a simple example. There is an assumption when people deploy devices mm -hmm. or, uh, they, that the network is constantly available. And when you have a scenario where the device doesn't successfully connect into the cloud server to deliver its data, it can retry. And they had scenarios where uh, in the processing that retry, they would uh, they, they, they would essentially retry and hammer the network in ways that um, cause a localized environment to be very antsy about uh, uh, the success rate they were achieving for those devices. So you need to plan for that. To have backup schemes, have appropriate mechanisms for taking themselves to the network when they are not successfully um, doing a transmission and connecting to the backend server. Okay, so all right. Yeah. Whose video isn't on, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Brian, I don't know if you can add to that, can you? Yeah, sure. Um, I, you know, I think the uh, the security side of this, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Um, Z, you you know, the availability is one of those things that sometimes people don't think about when they're really thinking about security. They're focused on. Um, you know, hey, am I encrypting the traffic? Am I encrypting what's getting stored? Um, you know, am I making sure that the message was delivered? Um, but really, it's it's that availability. And I think with IoT, we we got come into some interesting problems with radios, um, with distance from ground stations and aggregators. 
Uh, when we talk about scaling this, it's that secure interoperability that needs to be able to work at um, a, a, a proximal device level, as well as being able to connect to the cloud, right? Relying on, hey, I'm always going to have the, the cloud available to this device 24-7, five nines, right? VJ is going to talk about reliability and you know what that means. But that's not always the case. So we need to be able to aggregate, store, and forward. Um, there's a lot that comes into what happens in these devices. And sometimes we're going to have to delegate decision making. And the security of that and the safety of that uh, for different applications can also come into play there. So um, that, that's a big part of it. I want to also say onboarding is a piece people don't necessarily think about um, in this whole life cycle, right? There's the design and creation and shipping of all the devices for manufacturing. And then people jump right to, oh, I'm gonna now manage these things. But there's a gap in the middle. And if you're bringing devices on and you have to device by device, get you know some, um, some aggregator out and bring that device on and name it, that doesn't work when you're doing this for 5,000 light bulbs in a commercial building, right? You need a way to automate a lot of this. And that secure automation and secure management is a big part of what we're going to need. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, remind you of a point that you raised actually in the discussion beforehand, which is uh, you may not have access to the, uh, to the cloud 100% of the time. And uh, that might be a particular issue when you're trying to scale up. Would you just like to say a few words about that? Sure, I, I think um, you know it's an easy solution to say, all right, I'm gonna just um, collect a bunch of traffic and then route that to my servers. I'm gonna run that in any of the commercial cloud environments uh, and do all my work there. But when you're doing this, you have to really think about for particularly large scaled applications where you've got 10,000 plus devices, um, they're not always all going to be able to connect. And so um, where they aggregate, where that information gets managed, uh, you're going to need local um, proximal interoperability to be able to store that information, then forward it when that uh, service becomes available. You're going to need to be able to rely on that. Um, and you've got that same confidentiality and integrity aspect of how are you storing it? How are you making sure that the information hasn't been altered? Um, what about critical information? Are you going to have to prioritize that? These are things that you're going to have to look into when you're looking at that whole system. So thank, thank you, Robin. Yeah, that's great. That's super. So VJ, would you like to add anything to that? Um, so you're looking at it from a somewhat uh, different perspective, I think. Uh, uh, you, you have uh, the responsibility for IoT solutions overall for Mo in, in Motorola. Yeah. Um, so what, what's your take on that? So you know, I think the key question of what we see when working with our customers who tend to be pretty large enterprise customers uh, in different areas, right? And all these customers have been used to SCADA-like implementations in the past. And the big question, uh, I think the danger people always assume that, hey, uh, that IoT is all about uh, innovators, SCADA on uh, superchargers. Uh, but what they don't realize, it kind of starts opening up entirely new dimensions of the problem. So when uh, when the business operators want to say that, hey, now we want to get much more data in and therefore able to create much more analysis and driver, you start adding elements to the picture which are not there before. You have a lot more data being generated, as Syed and Brian were saying. Then you say, because of the data, I'm not going to keep it local. I'm going to send it to a cloud. And then because I'm going to send it to the cloud, how do you open up uh, security issues and reliability issues? And I think. Um, People don't think in terms of an eventual goal here of how this sort of stacks and start architecting for that from the beginning. Yeah. And that starts, uh, as you sort of build this piecemeal at a time, you start having all kinds of breakages. Uh, use examples, right? We were working with a prominent uh, uh, electric grid in, uh, in an Eastern European country. And when they were starting to uh, pump this data into the cloud, they clearly started to open up ports, their whole Chinese wall network. Uh, ports were open. And they had a DOS attack on it, and the whole system went down, and uh, people down half hour for three days, right? So, uh, and for us, it's sort of very easy to sort of see, hey, how could somebody ever do that? Uh, but you should remember, uh, people who are sort of there's a there's a confluence here between people who have business issues, 
and they're trying to solve and their issues was hey how do i provide a lower carbon footprints how do i provide more uh, reliable energy uh, and that's often in conflict with the what needs to be put from your security and reliability IT perspective and i don't think um, in typically uh, the incrementalism as it has not been uh, considering those two in parallel and how do you get those two teams to clearly articulate and drive together so you don't have in one end a solution which has nothing or the other end you have a solution which costs you uh, your goal filling so and uh, that's pretty typically what i've seen across pretty much any uh, any any enterprise we work with so uh, so i guess what what, what you're saying uh, well one of the things that you're saying is that if you have a small IoT solutions, it tends to be focused in a particular area. It tends to be a, a specific application, or a, but it's not. It's not like representative of the whole IoT solution that you're going to have later on. Whereas when you scale it, it's going to be across the uh, the enterprise. It's going to involve many more people. There are going to be many more applications, mm -hmm. and, and 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 the data that's going to go through it is much more varied as well. And you're going to do a lot of different things, and you need to plan for that. Is that is that no, precisely, right? Because most people start their, uh, any distributed enterprise or cooperation start their exercise on one site, right? And they say, wow, we are, we are putting in more sensors in there, we're getting in data, and it all looks great, right? The results. Yeah. Uh, and this is the same issues across correlation with cloud adoption issues as well. Once you start scaling this, there are elements you can't start, and start putting in place, which people don't take into consideration. So yeah. I would highly agree, try to, Nobody knows what the end goal here is because uh, it's obviously evolving. But try to plan out at least to a uh, deployment a year to or out, so you at least have a perspective of all the issues you need to handle. Right. Okay. Well, that's terrific. Um, so I'd like to put the next question to you, VJ, actually, which is, uh, what would you say are the most important costs to consider when scaling IoT? I think it sort of follows on naturally from uh, what you've just been saying. Right. Uh, absolutely. So I think this is, comes back to, right, uh, uh, when you start looking at uh, a land-based environment where everything is Chinese wall behind a single entity versus a WAN environment where things start becoming very different, right? So when you start considering a land environment, really seriously consider how secure and how reliable you want to be and how easy to drive this. Now, you're going to have dual networks. Uh, so in case, for example, Motorola, uh, Motorola Africa, we provide both uh, private networks as well as public networks because you want to have five lines reliability in case of any incident. Do you sort of try to edge devices? How much do you want to have local compute? And uh, the point went out when the connectivity goes down. You want those sites to still operate and drive. And that not only not puts edge compute devices, but also whole stack underneath it. So uh, really, I think from a cost perspective, the dimensions we are really seeing is uh, how much are you having a LAN versus a WAN environment? And then two, how uh, how critical it is for the data to continuously flow? Or are you able to deal with it uh, offline or not? And the third dimension is security. Uh, and there is no, people typically will say, hey, yes, we want reliability. Yes, we want security. Yes, we want WAN. Uh, but then end up with solutions which are totally non-cost effective for their, uh, for their industry. So uh, it's very carefully picking where you pick these and where to drive it. So for, to give you an example, for the most highly secure, reliable systems we put out there, 80% of the costs are spent on your security and reliability network perspective, uh, hmm. which could be down to 10, 20% in a, in a, in a four nine system versus a five nine systems. So something very key one should consider when designing these systems. Great, that's super. See, I don't know if you'd like to uh, comment on that. So, what what do you see as the most important uh, cost to consider when scaling IoT? Yeah, let me let me add to the comments that BJ just made. Absolutely, and I think we need to look at the entire chain, not just the communications pathway, which is often just a metered system. Mm -hmm. So particularly when you're using cellular IoT for data, but also the transmission of that into a cloud solution. It's the inbound data that's coming in and then the data that's being stored. One of the things that you have to be careful about is just because you can gather data out there doesn't mean that you should. Uh, and let me explain what I mean by that. I mean, I'm going to use a little simplistic example, if you don't mind. Fine. <laughs> years and years ago, we were speaking to a vendor. Yeah. 
vending machine company who said, you know, I can measure the temperature inside my vending machine at multiple spots to a nearest tenth of a degree, and I want to send that data. And my reaction was, uh, what value does that have, right? You're going to transmit the data over a metered system, pay for that data transmission, and then never really use that data later on. Uh, there's a wonderful term that somebody once used that uh, I think is, is is very important. You do not want to create a data museum. Okay, you do not want to just store data for the sake of storing the data. Right. It has some business purpose behind it. You want to analyze that data for a purpose. So if the data from the vending machine that's coming in says aisle number five, six, and seven are getting low, that's much more important than the fact that the temperature at the top of the machine is you know, 23 degrees as opposed to 25 degrees. It just doesn't matter. You have to figure out what it is you're doing. So the cost aspect of it is communications in a metered environment, that's gonna cost you. The transmission of that data at scale to a cloud-based uh, system is going to cost you. And then analyzing that data at the end, the compute requirements, which may be a little bit uh, uh, intensive but if you have too much data, is going to cost you. So all parts of the chain from the device to the storage need to be looked at and, and, and figured out as to where the costs lie. Uh, Brian said something which is incredibly important. Automate everything because the minute you do not automate everything and the minute you have to have people go in there, you may be losing some business purpose because the data no longer has relevance if it's looked at far too late. Uh, you need to be able to activate and provision devices very successfully, very rapidly, particularly if you're going to be deploying thousands of units every day, which we have some customers who are literally doing thousands of units every day, and it's a highly automated system for activating those devices. You should not have a support person call us or a support person person call the, the, the SIM providers because you're putting it in in the manufacturing stage. You're using, uh, you know, you're using onboard chip solutions for the SIM, et cetera, et cetera. Right. That planning has to be done ahead of time. Look at your cost. What are you trying to do? What data are you trying to send? What are the security implications of the data you're trying to send? And uh, where is the cost going to lie? There is an argument that I've heard that uh, you should uh, you should store as much data as possible from uh, every aspect of the uh, operation because if you don't even if you don't need it now you might need it in the future, and if you do uh, data analytics on it you might find that there's value in that at some uh, later stage and that uh, therefore it's an opportunity to uh, to improve things uh, over a period of time, but yeah I think that there's, there's a counter argument there that. Uh, if you store too much, it's probably expensive and, and not much return. I, I, I don't know what you feel about that because that kind of you know, that relates very much to what you've been saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's sort of both ways. What I usually tend to recommend to people is, okay, when you are up at a few thousand devices, gather all the data you want. You're still in the design phase of your application. Right. You're still in the deployment phase of your application. Bring it all in. Look at what's coming in and then make some decisions and use the software updates to trim the device uh, transmissions later on when you get to scale, because at some point, the economics simply will not justify transmitting that data. So you ought to think through that when you're small enough to not worry about the cost that you're incurring. But right. when you get to the few millions or tens of millions of devices out there, that cost could become prohibitive to the needs that you had for that data in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that uh, kind of uh, indicates what you should be doing with a small system in preparation for scaling so that you don't have to make all these changes, that you can be uh, a bit more specific about what you want out of that larger system rather than trying to replicate uh, everything in the small system for the large system that's exactly right you have to be you have to be pragmatic, pragmatic. about yeah. what data yeah. you right. can gather and what you should gather yeah that's great so brian did, would you would you you would you would obviously agree with that cuz i could hear you hey, i was getting ready to jump in i could see you nodding to a lot of that <laughs> I, I think, you know, what Z said about the value of the information um, in the in the simplified example with the vending machine, um, if you're using that information, like maybe one of those temperature sensors, if you're using that to justify a decision on whether or not like, hey, we've got predictive analytics that show, you know, if the temperature changes this much in a certain period of time, the likelihood of the compressor having gone out. Uh, is high and we may need to get somebody out there to fix it ahead of time. Now with the vending machine, you know, the, the financials of that may not weigh in. Um, but when you're talking about uh, uh, industrial cooling system that may spoil um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of meat, you may want to capture that information, right? There's value. And I think that's what Z was trying to say was, yeah. you know, make a decision and really think about what you need to collect. 
But yeah. one thing that I would mention, like the other part of my, my role is, is the, the privacy part. And if you're collecting information on IoT devices about individuals in a, like a non-industrial setting, um, what you're doing in a smart home, be careful with what information you're collecting, how you're storing that, what you're using it for, uh, because um, if that's not secured, you may lose control of it. Things can get used in, in weird ways. So from a security and a, a privacy angle, uh, there's some considerations that play into that value decision too. But um, there are lot, lots of really good pieces in there. And I, the one thing I wanted to mention on the, the cost front before we left, if you are an entrepreneurial company and you are the CTO and you're having a conversation with your CFO and the CFO says, how much is security going to cost me? You've already lost, right? This, this battle is gone. You, you cannot have that conversation. That is not a winning conversation unless the only answer that I think is acceptable is we're using a solution where security is already built in. It was part of the interoperability. It's part of the spec. It's where things like OCF and Zigbee, the, the point of trying to get devices to speak a common language and to have that credentialing that you can set up the trust relationships for, if it's built in from the start, you're in a much better solution. So if you're building your own thing, whatever it is, right? A dog collar with a GPS, you know, I, if you have to build the security, it's it's going to be that conversation. I think you've already lost. So think about other alternatives. So that that's thank you, Robin. That that was the last piece I wanted to throw in. No, that's that, that that's great. That's that, that's good. That actually leads me into uh, the next question for you, which is, uh, if you had to pick a single place to start with all the ecosystem around IoT, what would you say is the most important element to uh, to start with? I think I know what you're going to say there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well. I'll be more specific about it. It's not just security. Everything that we do in the security space, every single thing relies on one piece of information that the device cannot lie about who it is and nobody else can lie about being that device. So you have to have identity. The okay. device can't lie. That identity must be immutable, attestable, and unique. And if it's not, then it can be attacked. And so once you have that identity, you can hang all kinds of great security ornaments on that tree. But if you don't have it, you just have a pile of Christmas ornaments in a box um, and nowhere to put them. So um, that, that's, that's where I would start, Robin. Robin, well, can I add one comment to that? I think that is absolutely, <laughs> absolutely vital. Uh, Brian said something which I think is essential. Security by design, you know, it's a common phrase that uh, has, has gained popularity over the years. I first used it literally eight or 10 years ago and said, you have to engineer security into your design up front. Expect that it will need to be updated, which is important but you have to design the security in upfront because when you have 1,000, 10,000, 15,000 devices out there, which have been potentially breached, the cost of repair, the cost of fixing that is far lower than when you have 1 million, 2 million or 10 million devices out there. And now you're trying to fix those devices because of a security breach. You're not adding new features. You're not adding new functionality necessarily, but you're fixing a potential problem that has left your IoT application completely open to a problem. And that's something incredibly important. So do it upfront, watch it. When you're still small, when you have a small number of devices, see what's going on, figure out what security needs are evolving to, and then plan for an update because you're gonna need to, gonna need to do it. No, no doubt about that in my mind. No, that's, that's, uh, that's really great. I, I'd like to come back to that actually in a, in a little while because uh, this issue about updating is, uh, is, is really important. But uh, but moving on to um, the uh, the next question, which actually is for uh, for VJ, um, are, are there different challenges in scaling applications uh, application solutions in different categories? So, for example, in different sectors, do you see it uh, being more difficult in some uh, sectors than other sectors, or different issues in some sectors compared with other sectors, like sort of transport versus industrial, or, or something like that? I don't yeah. know if you have a view about that. So I think uh, this sort of ties back to the data generation issues, which uh, uh, Syed and Brian are talking about earlier, right? And I think that's big, the big difference. Uh, we see in sectors like, especially in industrial areas uh, and mining, etc., the amount of data which can be generated is 
enormous, right? Uh, so you can generally typically generate petabytes of data every day uh, from one site if you choose to do so and turn on everything. And uh, as opposed to if you look at some public safety applications and there's some threat issues and specific triggers on threats, or uh, then you tend to have very small amount of events in place. So there's a big extreme in how these drive. Um, and that's why sort of it sort of starts becoming important to have your anchor use cases on what problem you're trying to solve up front when you're putting these in place. Because uh, there's a very easy reaction I found most of them is, hey, there's so much, IoT is all about data and let's get all the data in one place and then we can analyze it and do some cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you start creating your data architecture with those perspectives and things very, very rapidly break down from there. So it's uh, it's really, and by the thing, not that you have to fix everything in stone up front, but unless you're sort of creating how much data you're generating, where it's happening, it's happening in land versus van, et cetera, you're not able to take and drive. Do you need an edge computing device? Do you need to, uh, can you just have connectivity directly from sensors out in the cloud and generating data? Uh, so these are sort of issues which sort of vary pretty rapidly based on what type of applications you're looking to do and drive. And, uh, and it's been very uh, easy to get taken away by, uh, again, look, sensors are so cheap now, right? You can get uh, sensors which last 10 years battery life for uh, less than 50 bucks now, right? Uh, but that's sort of deceiving people in terms of what can be done and what can be driven. And so very seriously think about uh, what is the business problem you're trying to solve here and how data consumption flows, where it needs to flow and how it needs to flow. Do you need aggregation or not before you start uh, opening the swamp up to everything? So that's mm -hmm. my experience. Robin, Robin yeah, can I, I add to that? Yeah. I think yeah. that, uh, uh, you know, I, Vijay hit, hit on something that's also incredibly important. I'm glad we're seeing consensus here. Mm -hmm. uh, edge computing is going to be incredibly important. When you have a small sensor out there deployed in the millions or tens of millions of devices that are out there, they're simply not going to be able to uh, do the kind of processing locally that they would need to. So having edge computing, having gateways where you can implement not only the security functions that Brian has, has talked about, but you can implement the, the necessary processing out there so that what you're transmitting is relevant. Because if the business is receiving data that is of no value or is flooding the systems for processing that data, you're, you're not taking full advantage of what the purpose behind that IoT application was in the first place. Right. Process the data remotely, send the exceptions, and in the case of a sensor that might be leading to a compressor failure, either it's a vending machine or a, or a high value HVAC system or whatever, have the intelligence in the processing, if not in a the sensor, then it's obviously certainly back from that in a gateway device or a uh, aggregation point where you can implement the filtering necessary to send just the exceptions and also deal with security issues. Right, yeah. Would you say, just going back to uh, my question, would you say that there are differences between different types of uh, applications or do you think that it is uh, common issues f across uh, all sectors, that these are, these are issues that uh, apply uh, everywhere? Yeah, I think it's a question of understanding what the impact of a breach is in particular, because if a, one of my sensors out there for a given company is, is failing to transmit the right data, I can filter that, right? I can understand the data scientists, of course, want all the data to be sent, but I can filter that data appropriately and figure out whether or not a sensor is bad. But if I have a device out there where a human life might be at stake, I need to be much more careful. Uh, if it's a medical device or even a vehicle in motion where a right. uh, hacker or a problem with security could cause a fatality, whether it's one accident or many people. And then engage that, right? If I'm doing a uh, water monitoring system that is looking at the distribution for a small city, and there is some kind of a terrorist issue where somebody has put the uh, you know bad things into the water that could cause a city or a small locality to be in trouble, then I really, really, really want to make sure that that data is analyzed properly and is dealt with in, in a way that uh, that uh, the threat is taken into account. So you have to look at each application separately. There are uh, sort of common subset issues, as you mentioned, Robin, but there are also specific issues based on the impact of a breach. Always look at what's going to happen if the, if the device is breached from a security perspective at scale. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's what's critical uh, for that particular uh, activity, for that particular operation, for that particular business or organization. 
uh, what, what are the most critical um, activities, if you like, and uh, the most critical data, and that's, uh, that, 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 may be, that will be different from uh, one, one, one organization to another. Exactly right. Right. So, Brian, I'm going to add to that. I think you would, actually. <laughs> so, I, one thing that I, I, I hear what Z is saying, and I worry what folks may hear, um, and I wanted to clarify one thing, Z. The idea of like how the data gets used and the purpose, I think, is is the important aspect of this. But what I, I have heard in um, industry sessions, people talking about different devices and saying, "Well, this is a this is a commercial, like it's you know the the Barbie doll. Um, I, I don't need to put security on this device because it's <laughs> just a light bulb." Right? What what am I gonna, you know, what's gonna happen? What are the hackers gonna turn my light on and off? And right. it's like, no, that's not the point. You're not protecting the light bulb, right? You're protecting yeah. your network. And the light bulb is this great way in, right? It's always got power, yeah. it has CPU, it has pro like the, the processor has memory. And when you brought it on your network, you gave it credentials. So if I can access that light bulb and you're not gonna install new firmware on that light bulb as often as you should. So if I'm gonna attack you, I'm gonna attack the light bulb, and from there I'm gonna look at what else is going on in your network, and that's what you're trying to protect is your network. It's not the light bulb. So when you look at devices and say, ah, this one doesn't need security, right? Ask yourself, is this device going to be a first class citizen on my network? Am I giving it credentials to do things or is it a sensor that's gonna send information to an aggregator and there, there's no other opportunity for that thing to get any info, to update, anything like that? Ask those questions. If it's a first class citizen, you, you absolutely need to make sure you secure that. Uh, yeah, Brian, I, I agree with you on that one. I think it's uh, uh, no, no arguments whatsoever. I just think the opportunity for implementing that security is not inside the light bulb. It is in the gateway in the home that is, connected to that light bulb. So I totally get it, but I think it's a, the right place for that security is where it matters. Who knows? If the I light bulb is capable. I, I think the firewall yeah, model of security and the perimeter yeah. idea, it, we have long since blown through that, right? <laughs> um, that may well be true. With, you know, the we've got UPnP. I can get into your network and I can get to a device um, without the firewall doing anything on that yep. and, I, and I can subvert all of it. And now you thought you were secure because you had a firewall up, but now I'm inside the network, right? We are a trust environment for everything that we do when we have to secure oh, agree. those. Agreed, agreed. So, uh, and let me use your Barbie doll example just a little bit further because, in fact, I wrote a blog on this about seven or eight years ago because oh, it isn't know. just a matter of, yeah, exactly. It isn't just a matter of the doll being taken over. The point was that the doll was then being used in ways that could seriously harm your child who was assuming that the uh, the doll was responding to it as opposed to some hacker who had taken it over on a system and was responding back to the questions that the child was posing to the doll. I totally get it. Uh, and your point about an analyzing even the sensors inside your home to see if they're capable of being taken over is important, no, no argument said. I'm just distinguishing uh, the point being that it might be a hierarchy perhaps, where if a light bulb is hacked and it's taken over and it has access to other systems inside your house, and that's an issue for sure. But if it's a door sensor, a door switch, um, that literally sends a, I'm connected and I'm sending a door is open or door is not, the opportunity for hacking is far lower than something a little bit further back in the chain. And that's my point. Yeah, so uh, Mr. to tie into your comment, right? I mean, from our practical experience or in the field, uh, we have sort of given up on the battle to say that every sensor a customer is going to put out there has gone through the rigorous security protocol under security checks, which are required to be doing, uh, because we have sort of seen that customers are not going to do that, right? They're always going to be uh, different types of DIY device or different type of device which come on to the net, uh, come on, and that's been uh, just a practical assumption. So what we have really instead chosen a sort of a defense in depth kind of approach in the drivers. Yeah. Uh, I'm very on this. Uh, what is actually a, the only first class citizens we have on our networks are these uh, edge devices we take and trust and drive and secure, and then uh, the capability of uh, what they can put beyond that. Uh, has been sort of loosened up in terms of the perspective. 
Now, look, I mean, this is a trade-off, right? Clearly, uh, there is a path, right? In theory, if, you, if, you, if you're a good enough hacker, if you get hold of any edge device, you can clearly find the work and get all the way through the network and take and drive it. Uh, uh, so the, the, the challenge is if you we have found there's absolutely no way to prevent people from putting uh, unmanaged devices of some nature on the network. You have to provide a path to that. Uh, otherwise, the system just becomes inoperational. Uh, yeah. And that's the and with the with the breach, I think Robin, you're probably headed to this this path anyways. But the idea with security is you can pay me now or pay me later, right? You right. can either set this up and, and be ready for it, or you can be surprised and say, "Oh my God, I got to send people out and touch every one of my ten thousand devices because, like, I didn't plan for a uh, secure software update, or I have a vulnerability that's possible now in." an entire fleet of devices, 100,000 devices that are suddenly available. Like, how do you control that? And how do you quarantine devices that you think may be behaving mm -hmm. interestingly, right? So a couple techniques, right? Software-defined networks, um, micro-segmentation, uh, being able to do some things with the network side. And then devices, and the IETF has um, a protocol MUD, which is the manufacturer usage description for devices. So a device says, this is what I look like when I'm on the network. This is who I talk to. Um, when I get my software update, I get it from this IP address. Um, and then as a network manager, you're looking at that and saying, oh, that's, that's expected behavior. Or, ooh, that's a whole lot of unexpected behavior from a refrigerator. I don't know why it's sending so much email. Right? Um, maybe I should shut that down, segment that off, and say, I still want the fridge to do its normal job and report on its normal things. But if it falls outside that description, I got to shut that down and alert somebody that, hey, there may be a compromise. Yeah, so I think uh, the lessons we really draw fear from was basically there's a lot of uh, past history on the BYOT devices at work, right? Uh, how people have brought their own devices and how systems have been managed to do that. And uh, lessons drawn from how BYOD has worked effectively at uh, enterprises are good lessons to take away as a sort of design and drive here. That's fantastic. Yes. So, um, so Brian, <clears throat> the, the 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 whole issue about uh, security and building up for security. Um, yeah, you know, when you've got a large deployment, um, do you think do you think there's anything else that we should take into account uh, as far as uh, introducing security is concerned? Um, you know, I think going back to the onboarding is a big one. Um, the Wi-Fi Alliance has Easy Connect. Uh, the idea here being, let's not give every device your SSID and your password for whatever Wi-Fi that you're going to put that on. Let's have individual credentialing, and you can automate that. The MUD from IETF is a big one. Um, identity, software update, you know, you've got these things in OCF and in uh, Zigbee. Uh, that secure software update um, and being able to plan ahead of time for automating a later deployment. Um, if you've got the identity, you can you can target specific devices and you know what's on your network. Um, and the other side of it is you can do real secure software download where you're going to validate you know what's what's the payload. Um, and VJ, I think if if I was imagining what you're thinking right now, VJ, it's well, hang on, that's what the edge device is for. And I think that there's a big play here for edge compute with, with secure software download. Um, devices, especially the, the, the sensors, if you're gonna update that and you're gonna say, here's new firmware, you basically doubled your, your bill of materials for that device because you're gonna have to have additional memory uh, to be able to store the new firmware, potentially validate it, deploy it, and if you do it the, the, the full right way, you might have to have three times the memory because you want to have a, a secure previous version, your working version, and your, um, hey, this is the new one I'm bringing down, how you validate that. There's a lot of opportunity here for edge devices to be trusted partners in the network to be able to enable a lot of this technology. Yeah, yeah the, and that's a very important point. Uh, right. Sorry, Robin, didn't mean to interrupt, no, but no, I no. totally agree with that. And that's why I feel that a lot of the security implementations, particularly when you do updates out there, are going to need to be a little bit back from the 
I'm making this up, the 10 cents door sensor, right? Or the temperature sensor. It has to be a little bit back from that. And there's going to be, as Vijay said, defense in depth. You need to have a hierarchy of places where you can implement certain security functions, particularly at scale. And that's my biggest concern. It's not that you take over one device or two devices or 10 devices. It's when you take over hundreds of thousands of devices, as we saw in that video camera hack that took place back about three or four years ago, which is that when you have a large scale security breach where the devices cannot be isolated anymore, or in the case of the video camera, many of the suppliers of that firmware had gone out of business, so you couldn't even get hold of the firmware anymore. How do you fix those kinds of things? And unless we plan for security updates up front, even on a device like a video camera because it's running embedded Linux, then the memory issue, the cost issues associated with that that Brian talked about become incredibly important, and you got to do that planning up front. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So I'd just like to extend the discussion on uh, edge computing, actually. We've had a, a question which uh, relates very much to, to that. So edge computing itself is uh, a lengthy discussion, which I expect we're going to get into, frankly. But I'd like to hear more comments on uh, how this can be more dynamic and also efficient in practical applications with some specific examples. And I was going to ask Vijay anyway, um, how, how does scaling of edge compute versus centralized pan, uh, models uh, differ? So yeah, if you have I mean, a compute model and a centralized model, how, how do they differ in, in terms of scaling? Sure. Uh, so, I mean, I'm going to say any practical application, I mean, I'm going on a limb here, uh, any practical mission critical application I've seen out there uh, has some form of edge compute kind of built into it, right? So uh, this uh, it could be the example of automobile, as I was saying, right, on one end, or which are actually truly mobile versus a move around or typically any kind of site local devices you take and drive uh, in place. Uh, and these sort of become critical for all the reasons we kind of talked about. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of data being generated. How do you sort of uh, keep those in reasonable volumes before you go into a cloud? Uh, trying to, you do not want to restrict data at the sensor level, right? Because then uh, you sort of start losing information. How do you sort of intelligently pack and drive it? How do you ensure security in terms of defense and depth and what you do and drive? How do you deal with network not availability and take and drive that and try and create perspectives on dealing with those? So for me, it's practically almost every um, every serious industrial application or enterprise application has some form of edge compute in place. Uh, now, the only uh, the only exceptions I've seen is pure data information like weather data and stuff like that, which is just totally distributed, and you want to get some sampling kind of data from different places. It's almost every other place in these other. Now, uh, edge compute doesn't need to take, a, can take different forms. It can take a form of a specialized device, like industrial routers and industrial drives in place. It could take an example of a specific uh, edge computer in a car, et cetera. But uh, you would see it pretty much in any place. OK. So Brian, I don't know if you want to add to that uh, about uh, the uh, the requirements for uh, edge computing and uh, and it's uh, the essential nature of it when scaling. Um, I think one of the specific examples to try to um, to try to answer, I think it was Ming Zhu uh, that had asked. Um, one of the examples of edge compute is. Uh, bridge device, right? So you've got devices from different manufacturers that talk different protocols and you need them to be able to, to communicate. And the, the trick with communication and secure end-to-end -end communication, um, it, even with when you put a bridge in the middle, if that bridge is gonna translate as an endpoint for one ecosystem and then reprocess that to send to the device on the far ecosystem, your bridge has privileged access to everything in both of those ecosystems. And it's, it's a security consideration to think about, right? So there, it, it ratchets up the, hey, this is a valued target. Um, and so when we do security, we don't blanket just say everything needs all of the, the security um, across the board, right? You're looking at an economic balance of risk-based security solutions and those edge devices need to be secured uh, and they need to be managed right so you can't just let that you know fire and forget uh, because of the the privileged access that they have okay yeah 
So Zia, did you have anything more to add to that or, or, or should we move on? Sorry, Z, uh, you're on mute. Is, are you there, Z? Hmm. Yeah, he had some back connectivity, so. Oh, okay. Z? Yeah, I'm back here now. Sorry about that, Robert. No, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. Fantastic. The, uh, the, I, I don't have anything to add to that. I think Brian has hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's just a mad question of where you want to implement some of these functionalities. You may have a distributed secure uh, security protection solution where depending on the capabilities of the IoT device or the gateway behind it, or even in the network. I mean, we've put security into our network, into our connections to our customers, et cetera, et cetera, where you have to deal with uh, potential hackers. And you just have to deal with it and, and understand what potential impact a breach could have and therefore what actions you can take to mitigate, reduce, and then ultimately update. That's the important point. Okay. All right. While I've got you, Z, I'd like to go back to uh, uh, this uh, issue about uh, updates because uh, we haven't uh, covered that and, uh, and you raised it uh, earlier on. So uh, debt remote updates also introduce a security risk. Well, clearly they do. Uh, by absolutely to updates and potential hacks yeah this is this is one of those uh, you got to have it and uh, you got to live with the consequences of that <laughs> issue updates are gonna be necessary you're gonna have you know no matter how well you plan you're gonna need to understand that new security breach techniques are being developed all the time and security in general is an evolving issue in over time and what may work today may not work a year, two, 10 years down the road when these IoT devices are deployed at scale. So updates are essential. And the question is, how can you validate those updates and make sure that they're being done uh, in ways that don't impact the device or you know, just the security uh, problems could exist within the update itself? Look at what happened with the SolarWinds hack, right? It's a classic issue. You were doing a, a update of software inside your system, but mm -hmm. the security of that update had been uh, badly hit. So yeah. that's just a classic example of what are the IoT device problems that could occur if you don't haven't thought this through. You gotta do, need to do the best you can. You gotta need to protect the security as best you can. And the way we've handled it, for example, is that we're looking at secure updates of vehicles uh, where you have back to out, of, out of band uh, validation mechanisms that say, yes, the update that is being attempted is indeed a valid update, all that kind of stuff. And you have to plan for that, depending on the, what the impact of a breach could be, you just have to plan for that. Mm -hmm. uh, th there are other aspects of uh, updates, which are, um, for example, uh, if you try to update everything all at once, uh, you might yep. have issues in actually being able to uh, achieve that. And then you've got failures, and then you've got uh, security risks uh, wow. arising from that. Uh, would, you, would you have a view about that? Absolutely. I mean, I think that the update management issue is is incredibly important. I mean, it's a it, it's one thing to update ten or a hundred or a thousand devices out in the field. Once you need to deploy uh, at scale, deploy a security update that goes out, or even any kind of update that goes out to a million or more devices, you've got to plan for that. You've got to have a management scheme for how that's done. Which device received the update, did the update, validated that they had indeed completed the update, et cetera, et cetera. That entire update management process, the OTA management process is something that's incredibly important. I mean, we stand on our head to uh, make sure that those kinds of things happen cleanly and effectively. And you, you, don't, you, know, you don't download the security update twice to a device that's already done it. But at the same time, you need to know which devices have not been updated and go yeah. back and manage that process, et cetera. There's a cost, there's a significant cost at least one or two of our customers I can point to, they do regular updates for the devices in the field. And that cost of doing the update is almost as much as what they pay for the services in the first place. How can you be sure actually that uh, that, that, that updates have, have affected or been updated, or all the devices out there have been updated? Uh, is it Validation. Yeah, the validation, the device has to respond back and say, yep, I got it, I did it, and this is my current state. And then you make sure that your, your OTA update manager maintains the latest information up, uh, appropriate for that device. So you plan on that. And there are, those are some things that uh, a number of uh, entities are out there trying to give uh, sort of, uh, uh, the best way to say it is version control, if you will, of what devices have what version of the firmware when it's serious enough to matter. Okay, all right. To, to, to Brian, did you? It looked as though you might want to make a comment on that. 
I, no, I'm smiling because Z hit every single thing I was going to bring up, right? It was like, <laughs> hey, signing this is great, but if you do, make sure you control the keys. Otherwise, you're in a situation like solar wind. We're going to talk about solar winds in this field for uh -huh. 15 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the supply chain implications of secure software update cannot be overstated, right? It is yep. so profound. Um, and, you know, you start to get it when you, looking at, hey, does a device and asking a device, it should be able to go and do this on its own, really, right? Of Do you need to be updated, Right. And it says, well, hold on, let me go find out. Right. And the answer is yes or no. Right. And it's because it went to a trusted source that it knows about. It was authorized to do that through the mud file. And it got the response back and said to your automated system, I don't need an update right now. Um, and there's also an opportunity to say from the automated system, I don't care what you think. You're going to go take an update and you're part of this cycle. Um, and being able to, to force that. But the, the signing of it, the verification of this, and the ability of the device to be aware of like, the version that it's like, that, these are all incredibly important. Yeah. And there's uh, some chain stuff that's probably an entire uh, webinar on just that. that I <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's true. After that, I think ultimately, this, even this issue, what you saw, so it comes down to the fact that. Uh, it's sort of a mortal like perspective, right? That, hey, we can create a defense, uh, which is highly secure, whether it's in different, different manners, as opposed to having the discussion that uh, breaches will happen, right? And I think Sai was pointing out, if breaches happen, how do you contain? As, uh, as opposed to just relying on the perspective that you can uh, guarantee that breaches won't happen. And I think that's philosophically a very different way of an entirely new field of how we have been looking at data flow, monitoring, anomaly detection and packets, et cetera, to sort of take that. But uh, the, the world needs to come more to that realization. OK, all right. Yeah, I totally agree, Robert. If I might interject again, I think on for both these points are incredibly important. Vijay said something that is fundamental, which is that whatever we do today, we know Oh, it's going to be a problem or, or there's going to be a, some kind of a security problem uh, down the road. And we just need to plan for how we mitigate, resolve and fix those issues that are out there. Isolate as necessary if, if that's what the outcome needs to be. And I think, uh, you know, the, the, the requirement for being able to do this at scale is the important point. Is that when you're dealing with a few devices, it's one thing when you're dealing with a half million video cameras or, or a million cars out there that could potentially become uh, affected by this. That's when you need to worry about this. Do the planning you can, but expect there's going to be a breach and expect that you need to be able to solve it. Right. Okay. Uh, we've had a, a further question from Ming, actually, which is, uh, I would also like to have some comments on TSN evolution in the IIoT field, if possible. I don't know who would like to tackle that. I yeah. see. Uh, Time-sensitive networking and industrial IoT, are those the acronyms that you're thinking? I think so, yes. Uh, yeah, I can take that. So, uh, so I mean, they have been, time-sensitive networking and real and IoT has always been there. You always had real-time kind of systems out there in terms of how, how to react and drive from that perspective. Uh, and typically, historically, these real-time network systems have been had to build by highly proprietary systems, right? You have a proprietary OS, you have a proprietary network, and to, to guarantee the some, sometimes microsecond response you want to take and drive. Uh, it is interesting to see how these uh, how these time sensitive networks will evolve and whether it really does make those implementations much more cost effective and much more widely spread. Uh, our perspective is that uh, it's not we haven't seen that yet. But it's a promising start on how TSN networks can address the real-time network problems. And we continue to uh, monitor and evaluate. OK. Would, would Z or, or Brian like to comment on that? No, no. No, I think that uh, VJ is perfectly spot on. We're going to need to see how the evolution of the uh, implementations um, is going to occur. The okay. needs for industrial IoT is somewhat unique in, in that regard. Yeah. Yes, that's that's certainly the case. Okay, I'd like to move on then. A uh, question for Brian. Um, and and you, Brian, you you've partially covered this already, actually. But in the event of a compromise of a large population of devices, specifically a large population of devices, what happens? How how can that be managed? How 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 do you go about it? 
Um, so I, I, I did touch on this earlier, right? Micro segmentation of the network. There are some things you can do from a network side of things where you can isolate the devices um, and then you can segment how you push updates to those. And um, then you're not running into flooding the entire network and all the devices are updating at the same time. You can schedule some of this, um, get yourself back kind of up and running. I think that's gonna be one of the key tools that network and you know, IoT system administrators are going to need. Um, you know, on that front, you know, when we look back, I don't know, 15 years, not that long ago, um, you know, you had enterprises that had, you know, desktops on everybody's um, desk, and maybe you had 50 to 100 uh, desktops, and you had a system administrator that ran around and touched all of them, right? You, you cannot afford to do that with IoT devices, right? It's the same compute power now that we had 15 years ago distributed like this, but you can't afford to have a person doing this. You've got to be able to automate it, and you've got to be looking at tools uh, where you are aware of this, so like the, the mud and being able to see what's happening on the network, and the micro segmentation, and then the ability to, to tell devices to kick off their, their update uh, on their own. I think that's going to be really important. And um, to tie back to the previous question on the uh, time-sensitive network, right. um, an industrial IoT may be a little different than where we see like things like healthcare and um, medical devices that are going to need uh, you know, secure interoperability, extremely time sensitive, life critical time sensitive. Um, you're still gonna need that security. You're gonna need to know that it's device A really talking to device B and they've proven that out to each other. But you're going to need to have protocols that allow for um, very quick and easy distribution of data, not huge piles of, hey, here's everything you need to know, right? It's no, you need to know these things because that's what you're gonna make a decision on. And that ties back to the very beginning of our webinar when uh, Z and VJ were talking about, hey, there's a business case for what data you're gonna need, right? And then things like that where um, you, know, you have a very strong business case for, I need this specific information to make a decision on when to um, you know, start the respirator for breath, that kind of thing. So those are the two, two things I wanna jump in. Yep, okay, all right. VJ, would you like to add to that or, or are you okay? No, I think uh, Brian said called that well, so I'm good. Okay. All right. Yeah, let me let me add to that, Robin. Just a very quick comment. I totally agree with Brian in that. The, and, and Vijay alluded to this as well. As I said, if you ask a data scientist, what do they want? They want everything. And then you have to understand what the cost implications of that are, right? And you have to understand what data should be sent. And here's the important point. You may need to do incremental changes out there. Uh, we didn't talk about this much, but if you have large numbers of devices deployed, Sending the alert, sending the unusual circumstances is probably more important, but you can also need to configure that. Maybe you do have a need to say, you know, for the next week, I'm going to gather everything that my 20,000 devices are sending because I need to analyze this one concern that has occurred. So you need to be able to configure and update the device out there if it has that capability to be able to change it and have it transport everything for a while and then you shut the filters down again. That's the kind of stuff you need to plan ahead depending on the application, what your needs are gonna be. It's not always easy, uh, but that's why I believe updates are essential. You need to be able to add capabilities that you may need down the road, whether it's for security or not. That's great. Okay. I think uh, I want to move on to uh, another topic, which is uh, also for you, Z, which is, uh, so what back office uh, functionalities and capabilities are, are most important for supporting high volume deployments? So you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier with things like billing and uh, perhaps not using an Excel spreadsheet or something like that when you get into a larger system. But uh, do you have uh, any, any views about uh, other things that need to be uh, catered for? Absolutely. I think it's essential to recognize that even in the normal co course of reduced amount of data that is specific to your application, when you get at scale, you're going to have a lot of data coming in. And if you don't plan for that ahead of time, you're going to you know, literally bog down your systems. Uh, we have customers that have deployed a few million devices out there, and they're sending, you know, multiple megabytes of data per month per device. If your backend systems, connectivity, your storage, your analysis, all of that stuff isn't taken into account. Uh, in this particular case that I'm thinking of, there was a TCP connection, not a UDP connection, meaning that the devices talk back and forth to a server. Well, if you have 
20 devices talking as opposed to 50,000 devices talking simultaneously. You need to be able to plan for that. Your backend systems have to understand that. Obviously, cloud plays a major role, so you can distribute that processing uh, not only within systems that are outside that can scale more easily, but also might be geographically diverse so that they can handle the connectivity requirements for de large deployments out in the field. Billing is an important criterion. If you're doing an end user uh, billing, uh, if you have an end user that needs to be billed, you need to be able to generate that bill on the fly. If you're not getting paid, you're not going to pay us, and we're concerned about that, obviously, right? It's, it's just a question of understanding what the plan is for the scaling of your back end uh, and whether or not you're going to take systems down, whether you have fault tolerance, whether you have redundancy, whether your devices, if they don't connect to the backend server, understand to back off. All of those things need to be taken uh, into account from a sort of end-to-end -end systems perspective. That's great. So, Vijay, I don't know if you'd like to add to that or not. You know, I think the key point I want to add in that is consider how you are sort of tying things together, right? I think uh, part of it is often in our case, at least, uh, they are not green fields, right? So they're kind of brown fields, opportunities, and what there you drive. And uh, turning all things on on a brown field causes own sense of havoc. Um, so uh, the experience when hey, think carefully. So there's two ways to approach this finally, right? You start turning things on small and sort of build your way up uh, to how you sort of increase the volume and increase the drivers, or you sort of start uh, the data scientist approach, as he said, and start big and sort of bring it down. Um, again, for the type of applications we deal with, we have sort of found is uh, get that use case uh, nailed down, turn on the information for that, start flowing that, build your systems on it. And then as you incrementally drive things, you can sort of increase and continue to do things. Otherwise, you'll run into the biggest problem we run into if people do things the other way. Uh, you tend to have a lab deployment uh, from our IT teams, uh, which are never, ever accepted into production at the uh, at the OT site, because they just say, hey, we're not going to turn all this on for you. So that's uh, been our, what we have seen out there. OK, all right. We have just time for one more question, which I'm going to put to Z. Um, when should we expect 5G to become more relevant to IoT? <laughs> uh, uh, a very uh, important question. <laughs> but uh, you've got two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to be quick about that. I'd like to separate 5G out into sort of the, 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 the multiple pieces that incorporate the technology, meaning you have the large-scale deployments, uh, low-power wide area, generally speaking, which are going to be used for the tens of billions of devices out there in time compared to the high-end data uh, transport applications where they'll be sending gigabytes of data uh, per device. You have to balance all of that out. And if you look at the low-end, uh, low-power stuff that's happening today, it's already impacting IoT. Uh, it's already impacting solutions uh, today. Whereas the high-end stuff is going to require wide-scale deployment of the network itself availability of lower cost radios in time. So 5G is an evolving uh, technology deployment today. It's becoming relevant in the low power wide area stuff. High end, high performance, low latency stuff is somewhere between three to five years away on uh, large scale deployment. That's great, that's great. Brian, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that? Uh, you, you were smiling there. And I was, I was smiling to the, uh, the your comment on, um, we'll have those low cost radios. Well, some. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, when we start talking about large scale deployments, the, the specific radio technology you're using is going to depend on, you know, hey, I'm, I'm looking at smart cities, I, I may need LoRa, I've got battery issues, you know, a lot of this stuff is going to play in, but really the fundamentals of how do you manage your fleet, how do you have that secure interoperability, how are you getting these updates, like, uh, it, it's not... It's not dependent on the radio that you chose to put in your device. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be key to remember. OK. All right. That's great. Well, I'm afraid that uh, that's the end of our session. We've, uh, we're right up against the uh, end of the time here. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank uh, everybody for uh, listening in. I'd particularly like to thank uh, Z, uh, VJ, uh, and Brian for uh, responding to all of the questions. Uh, we got through quite a lot there. And uh, I think it's all very interesting stuff. So. Uh, Thanks, everybody. And uh, wherever you are, I hope you have a, a, a lovely day or evening, <laughs> depending on your time zone. And uh, look forward to uh, listening to you or talking to you again uh, soon. So uh, bye for now.
Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And thanks to the audience for joining us.